Thank you, Carl. Good morning and welcome to Second Unitarian Church. I'm John Broom, a member of the board. My pronouns are he, him, and his. And I apologize for the aroma. This is construction. <laughs> Today we're in person at the Admiral at the Lake and here in the sanctuary as it may be and continuing to meet virtually using Zoom. We ask everybody's indulgence for the complications of a three-part service and we're glad you're here whichever way or however long you can be with us this morning. Following public health guidelines, we've moved to making masks optional. We remain committed to creating a safe worship experience, and if COVID numbers increase significantly, we will begin requiring masks for all comers. We especially welcome newcomers and visitors this morning. Finding a new community and making connections can be challenging, but we're excited to have you here, and we look forward to getting to know you. So if you're new to us today, Please note that in the Zoom chat or mention it during the conversation after service, which will happen right in the back of, of our loft area. Our worship today is led by Gregory Potts along with John Rice as worship associates. Music is provided by the director of music, Carl Kennedy. And as you might imagine, our time together requires a large number of people who make possible the worship and the music and the technical production. Their names are listed in the order of service. And we really thank them. Yeah, we thank them for their ongoing congregation. I have one announcement. This morning, somewhat obviously, we will have no coffee hour due to the complications of construction downstairs. We may continue that next week. We're just working as hard as possible to get that floor finished dry so we can move the pews in and move the whole process forward. Next, I invite Reverend Jason up to the pulpit after his time away for a short announcement. Hello, beautiful church. It is so nice to look at your gorgeous faces. Uh, I had a, just a brief announcement that this morning, is, or this whole weekend has been Market Days, which is a celebration of queer and trans communities uh, rooted here in Lakeview. Brandon Nix, uh, chair of the marketing committee, developed an outreach card for us to hand out. And he and I, and anyone else who might feel so moved with your Sunday afternoon to want to hand out some cards, we are not a proselytizing religion, but we are a information sharing religion. Uh, so very different, hopefully. But I wanna pass around this card and you can just kind of take a look at it. We already have some edits to the back for the future so that we can make it a little easier to read uh, and just be more, accessible to brand new folks who are checking out our church for the first time. Uh, so I will pass this around and I'm so excited to see you and look forward to worshiping with you this morning. Good morning. Good morning. We are Unitarian Universalist congregation a community of children, youth, and adults, a people of many beliefs and traditions, bound by the spe specific list of, bound not by the specific list of things we believe, but by the values we share. Whether you are joining us for the first time or for the thousandth time, you are welcome here. Whether you believe in God some of the time, all of the time, or none of the time, you are welcome here. Whatever your race, whomever you love, whichever way you move in the world, however much money is in your pocket, you are welcome here. I invite you, when you feel ready, to take a breath in and out. As the music begins, let us enter, in, enter into our worship service together.
In just a moment, Ryan Tebby here at 2U and, Har and Harris at the Admiral will light our chalices, the symbol of our faith. We light our chalices this morning with these words. At this hour, in small towns and big cities, in single rooms and ornate sanctuaries, many of our sibling Unitarian Universalist congregations are also lighting a flaming chalice. As we light our chalice today, let us remember that we are part of a great community of faith. May this dancing flame inspire us to fill our lives with the Unitarian Universalist ideals of love, justice, and truth. Please rise in body and spirit and join me in singing our opening hymn, number 1008, When Our Heart is in a Holy Place. Please continue to stand and join me in reciting our covenant. The words are on our screen, your screen. We covenant to build a community that challenges us to grow and empowers us to honor the truth within ourselves. We will be generous with our gifts and honest in our communication holding faithful to a love that embraces both diversity and conflict. Called by our living tradition, we will nurture spirituality within a vision of the eternal, 
feeling out our inner convictions through struggles for justice and acts of compassion. pronouns she, her, hers, and I'm doing the story for all ages, and if anybody is here that, who is young at heart and would like to come up forward, or feel free to sit where you are and be comfortable and look at the screen. Today's story is called, I Am Enough. Oh, come on down. Come on down. <laughs> come on down. <laughs> I Am Enough. And the author is Grace Byers. The pictures, the illustrator artist is Keturah A. Bobo. I gave it a French twist there. Right? Um, interestingly enough, the author, when she was growing up, was bullied a lot. And she wrote this story so that all of us would know I am enough. Like the sun, I am here to shine. Like the voice, I'm here to sing. Like the bird, I'm here to fly and soar high over everything. Like the trees, I'm here to grow. Like the mountains, here to stand. Like time, I'm here to be and be everything I can. Like the champ, I'm here to fight. Like the heart, I'm here to love. Like a ladder, here to climb and like the air to rise above. Like the wind, I'm here to push. Like a rope, I'm here to pull. Like the rain, I'm here to pour and drip and fall until I'm full. Like the moon, I'm here to dream. Like the student, here to learn. Like the water, here to swell. Like the fire, here to burn. Like the winter, I'm here to win. Winner, I'm here to win, <laughs> not the winter. And if I don't, get up again. I know that I may sometimes cry, but even then, I'm here to try. I'm not meant to be like you. You're not meant to be like me. Sometimes we will all get along, and sometimes we will disagree. I know that we don't look the same. Our skin, our eyes, our hair, our frame. But that does not dictate our worth. We both have places here on Earth. And in the end, we are right here to live a life of love, not fear. To help each other when it's tough to say together, let's all say it together, 
I am enough. Each year, we make a commitment, a pledge, to support the ministry of our church. In addition to this contribution, each Sunday, we take a collection so that we can share with those doing justice beyond our church community. While we are unable to come all together in person, you can still share your resources. To make your contribution, you can go to our website, or you can send a text to the number on the screen, or in the sanctuary, you can put your donation in the box at the back. For the month of August, we are sharing our plate with community, Chicago Community Jail Support. This morning, we have some words from Pip Paris. Hi, I'm Epiphany Paris. Everybody calls me Pip. I have been volunteering for Chicago Community Jail Support since uh, spring of 2021. The work itself started in the summer of 2020. People were getting arrested in the protests after George Floyd's killing. As activists provided uh, support outside of Cook County Jail, they saw that jail support was an ongoing need in the community and the work began. This is a truly horizontal grassroots mutual aid project. Every day, volunteers stand outside of the jail and provide hospitality, kindness, and aid to folks who are being released, as well as their family and friends who are waiting for them. We offer water, snacks, phone calls, coats, cigarettes, warming stations, and sometimes rides or emergency housing support to people as they get out. The jail doesn't seem to care about people at all. I have seen people come out into the cold winters with no coat and not even long sleeves. I've seen people who haven't eaten or had water all day. Very often people don't have a phone or a ride home. And so just sharing our own home phones for a phone call to a loved one or friend is an essential service. Sometimes fo folks don't have a home to go home to and we tried to help these people too when we can. I'll never forget the night that I met a man who was addicted to heroin, who was high when he got arrested and was still in withdrawal when they let him out. And he was fiending, but he was determined to get clean. It was a Saturday and everything was closed, so we helped him stay housed until we could help him enter rehab on Monday. He made it through the weekend and is still clean to this day. This is an essential work happening in our community and I am convinced that it saves lives. Thank you so much for any financial support you can provide. Now I invite you to join me in reading our offertory words the words are printed in your order of service and are on the screen. This church is the community of ourselves. Its energy and resources are our energy and resources. Its wealth is what we share. As we contribute to the life of this community, we affirm it and enable its participation in the larger world around us. The offering will now be generously given and gratefully received.
I invite you now, in the spirit of prayer and meditation, let us start by breathing together. Take a breath in and out. We begin in thanks, thankful for the breath in our lungs, the beauty of our earth, and the strength of this community. We hold in our hearts those who care for family and ill health, those who live with grief or chronic pain, those struggling with addiction or illness, seen and unseen. We are with you. For parents and teachers, and all those whose primary spiritual practice is caring for children, we are with you. We pray for our neighbors in prison, for those who are struggling to stay afloat in the midst of poverty. We are with you. We pray for all those living in harm's way. We pray for our planet and commit to work that will lead us away from the harms of climate change. We pray that wisdom, compassion, and empathy guide the leaders of our world. May they and we be instruments of a just and lasting peace. Our lives are blessed by those who knowingly, with curiosity and courage, faced their final days. Into this shared silence, I invite you now to speak the name of anyone you wish to lift up into the loving support of this community. With our deepest compassion, let us hold these names in our hearts. Those named and unnamed, those remembered and those forgotten. Let it be so. Amen and blessed be. During our ritual of lighting candles for our joys and concerns, we want to continue to maintain our safety with each other. In the 2U Sanctuary, you are invited to come forward and light a candle. As you end your time of contemplation and candle lighting, we invite you to use the hand sanitizer available. For those at the Admiral, I invite you to come forward and take a pebble from one bowl. Hold it tightly, putting your energy into the stone, and then knowing your joys and sorrows to be shared by this community, let it go lightly into the other bowl. For those of us on Zoom, join us by sharing your joys and concerns in our chat window. And I will light two candles here, one representing all our unspoken joys and another for all our unspoken sorrows.
celebrations, sorrows, and struggles close to our hearts. John, would you share our first reading, please? Our first reading this morning is from Bell Hooks. Taught to believe that the mind, not the heart, is the seat of learning, many of us believe that to speak of love with any emotional intensity means that we will be perceived as weak and irrational. And it is, is especially hard to speak of love when what we have to say calls attention to the fact that lovelessness is more common than love. That many of us are not sure what we mean when we talk of love or how to express love. Everyone wants to know more about love. We want to know what it means to love. What we can do in our everyday lives to love and be loved. We want to know how to seduce those among us who remain wedded to lovelessness and open the door to their hearts to let love enter. The strength of our desire does not change the power of our cultural uncertainty. Everywhere we learn that love is important and yet we are bombarded by its failure. In the realm of the political, among the religious, in our families, and in our romantic lives, we see little indication that love informs decisions, strengthens our understanding of community, or keeps us together. This bleak picture in no way alters the nature of our longing. We still hope that love will prevail. We still believe in love's promise. Our second reading is found in the hymnal, 598. It's also going to be on the screen as well. And I was hoping you could join me in helping to read the parts in italics. The reading is from the Buddhist tradition. It's titled, Without Hate. May every creature abound in well-being and peace. May every living being, weak or strong, the long and the small, the short and the medium-sized, the mean and the great. May every living being, seen or unseen, those dwelling far off, those living nearby, those already born, those waiting to be born, may all attain inward peace. Let no one deceive another. Let no one despise another in any situation. Let no one, from antipathy or hatred, wish evil to anyone at all. Just as a mother, with her own life, protects her only child from hurt, so within yourself foster a limitless concern for every living creature. Display a heart of boundless love for all the world in all its height and depth and broad extent. Love unrestrained, without hate or enmity. Then, as you stand or walk, sit or lie, until overcome by drowsiness, devote your mind entirely to this. It is known as living the life divine.
Lovely. So I was here for Pip's sermon last week, and in their closing comments, they said that love is a central value of Unitarian Universalism. And I appreciated them serendipitously passing me the baton because my theme today is love. And I agree with Pip that love lies at the center of Unitarian Universalist faith. Interestingly, the word does not appear in our seven UU principles, although that may change if the proposed eighth principle is approved. But the word does appear a couple of times in our sources of faith. It runs throughout our hymn books, and indeed, we UUs have embraced side with love as a slogan for our justice work. Psychologist Eric Fromm offers what may be the core message that I will elaborate on today. He said, love is the only sane and satisfactory answer to the problem of human existence. Personally, I extend that beyond humans to other creatures as well. In preparing to speak to you today, however, I discovered that as important as love is to us, it is also difficult to talk about because it is slippery to define and because if you aren't careful, you run the risk of being viewed as silly or sentimental or starry-eyed. In our first reading today, we heard words from the acclaimed educator and author, Bell Hooks, about the problem of lovelessness and the problems of talking about love. However imperfectly, I'm gonna to try to wrestle with some of the paradoxes that Bell Hooks challenged us, us with. If love is so great, why can't it be just a little easier and less complicated? <laughs> why do we experience what Surgeon General Vivek Murthy has called an epidemic of loneliness? I offer no easy answers today, but I assert that these are critical questions that we need to wrestle with together. And I'll try to point at least in a general direction. The topic is broad. I'm kind of offering you my Unitarian Universalist elevator speech today. In other words, this is the core of what matters to me. But it's gonna be a long elevator ride. Imagine you're going to the top floor of the Burj Khalifa. In fact, maybe two or three times. I'm gonna share a few personal things from my own life today. Not because the sermon is about me. It's not, it's about all of us. But it does come from one person's perspective. And I hope that you'll be able to relate to at least some of my experiences. So I got married in this church in 2011 with another man. That was before the state of Illinois had begun to recognize same-sex marriage. So at that time, our legal arrangement was called a civil union. If you had spoken to me that day, I probably would have told you that it was the happiest day of my life. But things changed, and I got divorced in March of this year, which has left me with a lot of things to reflect on, especially related to love. I was with my ex-husband for 15 years, and during most of that time, I said and believed that we loved each other, even when things were not going well between us. But feelings changed over time, and that stopped feeling true. Now I look back and ask myself, huh, was I using that word correctly? Did we really love each other in the first place? And honestly, I still kind of wrestle with that question. But I'm gonna say the answer is yes. I did love my ex-husband, but love between two people can be fragile. It has to be carefully tended to regularly or it can wither. And long story short, it did. Another experience this year that has caused me to reflect on love was a healing retreat for gay and queer men that I went to in the California desert back in February. During a three-night retreat, together with a group of about, about 15 men, I experienced the formation of a little community, a temporary tribe, a tribe of the heart. 
I haven't had much communication with most of the other participants recently, but I carry them and that experience in my heart. In just a short time, we brought down walls and began to open up in deep ways and to express affection freely. I learned that with skillful facilitation and open spirits, it is possible to risk vulnerability and build intimacy and love with someone you've just met. I said I love you to some of those guys after just a few days together, and it felt completely natural and authentic. I also learned that you can't hold on too tight because experiences of love are sometimes temporary, and that doesn't invalidate them. I experienced joy and even ecstasy during that retreat. I was sad when it ended, and I remained changed by it. So, Going back to the question of a definition, do you understand the word love the same way that I do? Probably not, because your understanding of love is shaped by your own unique life experiences, just as mine are shaped by my own experiences, like the ones I've just shared. And it is normal that our understandings may shift over time as new stages of life bring new experiences of love and loss and heartbreak. We search for words to define love, but they will only ever be provisional and approximate. One problem in defining love is that there are so many different phases of love. There's romantic love or sexual love, the love between parents and children, the love between siblings or friends, the love you have for yourself. I hope you have love for yourself. The love between you and your dog, the love between your dog and your cat, maybe. <laughs> and there is love among the congregants in our church. You can feel love for family members you've known your whole life or someone you just met. You can feel love for the living and also for the dead. I think we can even have a certain kind of love for people or other creatures who we've never even met just from hearing stories about them or seeing images or videos of them. Now we also speak of loving things that aren't living beings at all. Maybe you love music, you love desserts, you love video games, you love to read. For the purpose of this sermon, that is not the use of the word that I'm talking about. I'm only talking about the love between and among sentient beings. I'll give you my best shot at a definition for today's purposes. The love I'm talking about is both a feeling and an action, a noun and a verb. Love is a feeling of affection that you share with someone else, the affection that brings you pleasure to be in that person's presence and makes you think about them fondly when they aren't present. Along with that affection comes care and concern we may also feel care and concern and compassion for those whom we've never met, and that can fuel our struggles for justice. Feelings of love and care want to be demonstrated by protecting someone, defending someone, doing nice things for them, sharing pleasure, pleasurable physical touch, laughing together, making friendly eye contact, showing kindness and compassion and non-judgment, listening, or just telling someone I love you. There are lots of ways that love can be demonstrated. Regardless, love isn't fully realized if it is just an internal feeling. Love only fully meets my definition when it is lived through actions. However we may define it, I assert that love is fundamental to our well-being. Social worker and author Brene Brown talked about the vital need for love and the risks of not having it, writing, we are biologically, cognitively, physically, and spiritually wired to love, be loved, and to belong. When those needs are not met, we don't function as we're meant to be. We break, we fall apart, we numb, we ache. The absence of love and belonging will always lead to suffering. Here's my shot at summing up my faith in love as I understand it today as concisely as possible. I break it into three articles of faith. 
Number one, I am lovable and worthy of love. So are you. We all need and deserve love. Number two, love is an abundant resource. And number three, love is a choice that we get to make every day. We should say yes to love as often as possible. That's it. Maybe it seems oversimplistic, so let me unpack my three articles of faith. My first article of faith says that we are lovable and worthy and that we all need love. <clears throat> this is kind of my own repackaging of our first UU principle, which speaks of the worth and dignity of every person. The word every is what is meant by the universalism part of Unitarian Universalism. Everyone is inherently worthy and lovable, even if that worthiness hides behind many walls. And I know what you're thinking. Come on, Pots. Donald Trump is not lovable. <laughs> Hitler and Jeffrey Dahmer were not lovable. Right? I struggle there, too. Remember, I told you I wasn't going to provide easy answers today. But when it comes to thinking about inherent worth with people who do horrible things, I try to moment, momentarily set aside their behaviors and remember who they were on the day that they were born before things went off track. And I know, baby Hitler, it only partly solves the problem, but... <laughs> but people probably wouldn't do so many horrible things if they were loved more fully early in life. And I make a distinction between saying that someone has inherent worthiness versus saying that I personally feel love for them. We can be hurt in so many ways. We experience rudeness, injustice, abuse, violence, neglect, abandonment, betrayal, indifference, the moment when you're experiencing those things, talk of love may feel really distant or even absurd. When someone hurts you, remember that you didn't deserve it. Because you're worthy of love. You are lovable. When someone injures you unprovoked, it tells us something about who the perpetrator has become. It doesn't tell us anything about you. When you're feeling lonely, you may think that that means you're unlovable. Lovable people don't feel lonely, do they? Yes, they do. All of us feel lonely sometimes. And if it goes on for long, it can be devastating. But know this. Loneliness doesn't say anything about your worthiness of love. When you feel lonely, you must hold on to a conviction that you are worthy and lovable. Love yourself and remember that there are others who love you and who have loved you even if they aren't present. In my experience, that knowledge can relieve at least a little of the pain of loneliness. A saying has become popular on social media in recent years. You haven't yet met all the people who will love you. I apologize that I don't know the original source of the quote. If someone does, let me know. But what a hopeful thought. The hope of future love can also help in times of hurt and loneliness. I know hurt and loneliness through recent experience, before, during, and after my divorce, and at many earlier points in my life, too. And these three articles of faith are what have carried me through the hardest parts of my journey. It may be a surprise that love's the theme that I would choose so soon after divorce, but to me it makes perfect sense. The dissolution of a loving bond did not shake my faith in love itself. I've been hooked on a pop song lately by British singer Alison Goldfrapp called Never Stop. <clears throat> and the refrain is simple. She hypnotically sings over and over, never stop, never stop loving. And I'm not calling this song profound art. <clears throat> but pop music is one of my antidepressants. So in the spirit of that song, when one experiences the end of one love and you grieve the loss, 
the question then arises, where can love take you next? As central as my marriage was in my life for many years, it was never the only source of love around me. In a moment of pain and crisis, you may be surprised and grateful to discover who shows up for you. And I had a lot of people show up to support me during this process, for which I will always be grateful. I never stopped loving. I remain somewhat emotionally and spiritually battered, and I'm in the process of healing. And my healing depends on deciding to let divorce break my heart open rather than breaking it apart. I'm working to stay open. My second article of faith says that love is an abundant and available resource. Please don't hear that as naive. I also recognize that lovelessness and even hate are abundant. I'm in no way minimizing or sugarcoating that reality. Love is abundant, but not distributed fairly or evenly. In fact, some people and animals go through their whole lives experiencing little or no love. And some people, even when offered love by others, somehow aren't equipped to receive it or return it. I struggle with these things. Our second source of faith speaks of the transforming power of love to combat evil. The fact that there is evil in our world is precisely what should motivate us to bring more love into the world in response. When I witness or experience hateful or cruel behavior, I tell myself, this isn't all there is. You can look at evil without it shaking your faith in the abundant, healing power of love. I carry my conviction in the abundance of love in our world with me at all times, even when it is least evident. This isn't a blind faith. It is a faith in something that I have experienced and know is just as real as the ugliness that we witness in dark moments. And this idea is so beautifully uh, expressed in the closing hymn that we will sing today called There is More Love Somewhere. Lovelessness and loneliness and hate are real and abundant. But I don't believe hate will have the final word or win the final victory. My final article of faith says that love is a choice. When we choose to side with love, we exercise the power to add to the abundance of love in our world. Through our choices, we can make our own lives fuller of love. We may be able to make our families and households overflowing with love, or to move on to more loving families if needed. We can grow the love in our congregation, and in our small but meaningful ways, we can make this world a more loving place. The nice thing about that is it's win-win. When you give love, you also benefit. Giving love at its best should not be self-sacrificial. But love does, risk, does involve risk and vulnerability. Our hearts are just as vulnerable to injury as our bodies are. We can't give our love indiscriminately. It is wise to protect ourselves. When you realize that someone isn't good for you, it is not only okay but necessary to take a step back. That is why I'm divorced. And I've spent too much time beating myself up for staying too long in a situation that had turned toxic. But we all make these missteps. So I try to give myself credit now for trying very hard to love and be loved. That was courageous. But at a certain point, I had to stop trying there and to take my heart to new people and new places. It is tricky to develop the discernment and courage to know when to take the risk of putting our hearts out there and to risk being hurt, and when it is better to protect ourselves. If we overprotect our hearts, we can miss a lot. Sometimes the fear of getting hurt can tempt us to turn toward various forms of toxic tribalism. We think, mm, maybe if I avoid differences, that will be safer. And that can lead to many forms of division and hierarchies. We divide ourselves based on race and ethnicity, nationality, region, native language or accent, 
immigration status, age and generation, gender identity, sexual orientation, relationship status and family configuration, ability and disability, body shapes and sizes, species, economic status, religious identities, and so on. We must dare to cross those barriers of difference. So am I saying that we're being toxically tribal right now by identifying as Unitarian Universalists and gathering among other people who have embraced the same label? Hopefully not. But there is a choice about how we approach this community. If we use our religious tradition just as a safe bubble to hide in and to divide insiders and outsiders, then yes, that is a problem. If we do that, we become a destructive force in the world. But I think Unitarian Universalism at its best encourage us to, encourages us to reach beyond our walls and to build bridges that break down barriers. It's okay to create safe spaces with people that we find commonalities with. I'm just saying we can't stay there all the time. So that's it. Let me restate and summarize my personal articles of faith. Believe that you are lovable and worthy even when you feel hurt and lonely. Know that this world is full of healing and delightful love, even when the evidence is scarce or absent in a given moment or place. Side with love whenever and wherever and however you can. Look for opportunities to experience and spread love. Dare to cross barriers of difference. And in doing so, you will both give and receive gifts. In closing, let me say another hard thing about talking about love is that I don't want to be called out as a hypocrite if you ever notice me being rude or cold or distant. <laughs> I'm human. I experience fear and anger and hate. I'm not, I'm not perfect. I make no promises. My intentions are pretty good. But the fact is that just because I'm talking about love today does not mean that I'm holding myself up as an exemplar. I screw it up, we all do. We are all learning to love all the time and no one will ever master it. But the important thing is to be self-aware of our feelings, to apologize when needed, and to make amends and correct course when we are hurtful to others. And to try again and again to get it right the next time. Never stop, never stop loving. Please join me in singing hymn 95. There is more love somewhere. The message we spoke of our closing hymn is coming from the Gullah people of the Georgia Sea Islands, a community with a strong, strong cultural connection to their African origins. It is a song of deep spiritual longing and hope for the future. So, with respect to those who kept this music alive, I invite you to sing our closing hymn, There is More Love Somewhere. Um...
more joy. on your heart or clasp hands with those you are sharing your life with during these pandemic times and hear these words of benediction from Elena Westbrook. Go in hope for the arc of the universe is long and we can bend it toward justice. Go in courage for together we have the strength to confront injustice in our daily lives and the larger world. Go in love because a holy and generous love is both the reason and the means by which we transform our lives. Blessed be.